In gratitude and joy for all of God's blessings, let us rise in body or spirit and worship God together using the call to worship. God has rescued us from the power of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of the beloved Son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Christ is the head of the body, the church the beginning, the firstborn of the dead, so that he might come to have first place in everything. We worship and adore you, Christ our King.
may be seated. Jesus, remember us and hear our prayers of honest confession this morning first in silence. And now together, Prince of Peace, we confess the barriers we build, the self-protective numbing we conjure to distance ourselves from the pain of this world. We harden our hearts to the suffering and behave in ways far from humane. Soften us, Jesus. Humble us with the compassion you exhibit from the cross. Guide us to live open and wholehearted lives as we attend to the needs of others. Amen. Hear the good news. From the cross, Jesus says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. This forgiveness permeates our faith. It is the invitation for each of us to respond to the grace of our God with joy and hope and compassion for ourselves, for each other, and for the world. Know that in Jesus Christ you are forgiven and live into this peace. Amen. the peace of Christ with one another, respecting each other's comfort levels. May the peace of Christ be with you. Peace, Juliet. Peace, everyone. Peace. Peace, peace everyone. Peace, everybody. Hi, Gilly. Peace. Hi. This is Betsy Taylor. It's just a joy to be with you. You know, that is. Good no. Face, my friend. <laughs> if you know. Sally and Court, how are you doing? Doing very fine. Well. Thank you. Aging very nicely. <laughs> <laughs> Keep it up. Keep it up. <laughs> Do. That's what we're doing. We're doing. Julie, are you back in Baltimore? I am for through Thanksgiving, and then I go back to the Cape on Sunday. Next. Oh, well, we miss you so much. <laughs> hey, that'll be the last trip. I go back. Part of going back. 
on 95. So mm. It's OK. I'm finding I like interstates less and less and try harder and harder to avoid them. <laughs> yes, exactly. The drivers are just crazy and good morning and welcome everyone give you a minute to find your seat recording it's great to welcome everyone to brown memorial this morning whether you are in the space or joining us online this morning we're glad that you're here with us uh, for those in the space, a reminder that uh, masking remains optional for everyone, except while singing, we do ask you to wear a mask at that point. To stay informed about everything that's happening in the life of the church, we invite you to turn to the back of your order for worship today. There's an announcement section that lets you know about what is happening in the life of the church. And please note that the church office will close this Wednesday at noon for the Thanksgiving holiday. Um, and Reverend Gretchen Van Ut will be on call for pastoral emergencies. Um, today you are invited to stay after worship, worship to, to make an Advent wreath today in the assembly room. And in light of this annual event, we will not be having lunch or the education hour as is usual. So both will return next Sunday when we will begin a new series on the stories of Jesus' birth led by the Reverend Jack. Hodges. Um, I do want to let you know about several uh, uh, pastoral concerns this morning. One is that uh, Mary Jane Sokol is in the hospital after all, so we keep Mary Jane in our prayers today. I don't, I'm not sure if uh, Michelle let you all know last week about the prayer concern for Tom and Taylor Stewart. Uh, yes, um, so we continue to pray for them both as they expect their first child and as Tom undergoes treatment for cancer. Um, and I'm understanding from Tom that things went very well this week with his first round of chemo, which is good. And lastly, I'm very, very uh, saddened and sorry to let you know that I learned this morning that Don McPherson died suddenly. Um, I know he was with many of you yesterday at one of our church activities. And I spoke with Ann early this morning after they rushed him to the hospital. And she asks for everyone to please lift her and her family in prayer um, as they adjust to this very unexpected um, uh, death in their family. I'd like to invite the children now, any children present, to join me at the front for some time together. Well, good morning, everybody. Well, this morning, the story from the scripture is about a man named Zechariah. And Zechariah is the father of John the Baptist, who we get to know as we get close to Christmas. So we'll be hearing more about John the Baptist. But one of the interesting things about Zechariah is that he has to stay silent. God wants him to stay silent and not speak for nine whole months. You thought I was going to say nine years? So, so do, do, you, do you think you could be silent for nine months? Well, I'm wondering what happens, what happens when you get really quiet? Give it some thought and think about what happens when you get really quiet, just in your own experience. I'd love to hear. Anybody? Oh, look, right now we're, we're being silent. I like it. <coughs> you have an idea? Say, uh, take the mic and say it close. You think. You think. What do you think about? You know I'm going to ask you more. Um, I think about, um, like, 
I thought about um, Jesus hmm. and God. You do. You think about Jesus and God. And Zachariah. And Zachariah. Okay, you did in this moment. You thought about those things. Okay, great. Anybody else? What about not in this moment? What about in other moments when you're quiet? What happens? Or maybe, you, maybe you're not quiet a lot. Some of us aren't quiet a lot. <laughs> All right, Augie, share, share with us more wisdom. Um, I, like when I'm quiet, I, I kind of fall asleep. You kind of fall asleep? <laughs> yeah, sometimes you realize that you're tired, right? I think sometimes people stay moving because they don't want to realize that they're tired. Yeah. Yeah, and I sometimes read. You sometimes read. When I'm silent. When you're, when you're silent. Those are great examples. Anybody else? Well, um, if you notice this morning when I shared the time of forgiveness at, uh, right before that and the, the prayer of forgiveness, the prayer of confession, we spend a long time staying quiet, a very long time. And some people have told me, that's very uncomfortable for me. I think you take too long. We should shorten that up because um, it feels really long in church to be silent. But what Zechariah learns when he's silent is that he learns to hear from God. We don't know exactly how. We're not told that God speaks directly to him, but after nine months, my mic is not working well, after nine months, he opens his mouth and he shares some deep, deep wisdom from God. Some deep, deep, dark secrets? Well, maybe that too. I think it's more like deep wisdom. But you can read it for yourself and decide if it sounds like a deep, dark secret something else. So I want to invite you, especially as things get cold and dark in this season, to spend a little time, you know, once a week or maybe even once a day, getting quiet. Getting quiet, finding a comfortable space to be quiet in, and see what happens for you. And I might ask you about it later, because I would love to hear what happens to each of you. Okay, let us pray, and you don't have to repeat after me, you can just listen. God, thank you for the silence, and thank you for finding us in the quiet of our hearts. Amen. All right, now, if you guys want, you can stay up here, because we're about to have, count them, not one, not two, but three baptisms this morning. And if you want to uh, stay on the front row, you can do that. And I'm going to ask the Aaron family to join me over by the font. And anyone who they invited to stand with them. And also Vi Thorpe, our elder, who is representing the session this morning. I think uh, many of you in our congregation will recognize Ben Aaron, who's been a regular weekly worshiper with us now for, how long has it been? Since last year, it's been at least a year. Uh, and we had a conversation a few weeks ago in which he said, do you think my grandchildren could be baptized at Brown Memorial? I love the church. And I said, absolutely, just give me their names and I'll be in touch. And then when I reached out to, to Alex, I, I, I knew immediately that we had been working together on a plan to rebuild Baltimore City. Um, and he's a developer in town um, and cares very much about our city and about home ownership and families having access to a uh, home. So it was a delightful, serendipitous connection that we made that day. So it's an honor to be here with Alex and Irene. Um, and they're here with me at the baptismal font, as I said, along with Vi Thorpe over here, who will be representing the session. This sacrament is not an end in itself, but a presentation of what we hope and claim for the future. 
a sign that God is going ahead of us as God went ahead of the Israelites across the Sea of Reeds to set them free from Egypt and to make a nation of them. A sign that we must follow where God leads, taking our children by the hand and gently leading them until they are able to say with Christ that in life and in death we belong to God. So let us remember with joy our own baptism as we celebrate this sacrament. On behalf of the session, I present Ace Chinedo, Aaron, Sir Chinosi, Chidozi. Chidozi, Aaron, and Naomi Ijoma, Ijoma Maria, Aaron, to receive the sacrament. And now I have some questions for the parents to Alex and Irene. Do you desire that Ace, Sir, and Naomi be baptized, do you? Relying on God's grace, do you promise to live the Christian faith and to teach that faith to your children? Trusting in the grace, gracious mercy of God, do you turn from the ways of sin and renounce evil and its power in the world, do you? And do you turn to Jesus Christ and accept him as your Lord and Savior, trusting in his grace and love? And finally, will you be Christ's faithful disciples, obeying his word and showing his love? And now to the kids who are present with us today, do you, the children of the church, promise to be a friend to Ace, Sir, and Naomi? And if they have questions, will you help them look for answers? If they get hurt or feel bad, will you help listen to them and help them feel better? And will you play with them and share with them the stories of Jesus? And finally, to the members of our church, do you, uh, as members of the Church of Jesus Christ, promise to guide and nurture Ace, Sir, and Naomi by word and deed, with love and prayer, encouraging them to know and follow Christ and to be faithful members of Christ's church? If so, please say, yes, we will. Yes, we will. Let us pray. Eternal and gracious God, we give you thanks for your history of saving us, for bringing us through the stormy waters of the Red Sea, for sending Jesus, your Son, for giving us the gift of baptism, a passage from sin and death to rebirth. Thank you for giving us your Holy Spirit who teaches us and leads us into all truth, sending us into the world to serve you as a royal priesthood. Pour out your Spirit upon us and upon this water. May Ace, Sir, and Naomi, who now pass through these waters, be delivered from death to life, from bondage to freedom, from sin to righteousness. Bind them to the household of faith, guard them from all evil, strengthen them to serve you with joy until the day you make all things new. Amen. What is the full name of this child? Ace, Chenadu Aaron, I baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, one God, mother of us all. Defend, O Lord, your child Ace with your heavenly grace until he comes to your everlasting kingdom. Amen. What is the full name of this child? Sir Chidoze Aaron, I baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, one God, mother of us all. Defend, O Lord, your servant, sir, with your heavenly grace until he comes to your everlasting kingdom. What is the full name of this child? Naomi Ijoma Maria Aaron. I baptize you in the name of the Father, 
and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, one God, mother of us all. Defend, O Lord, your servant Naomi with your heavenly grace, that she may come to your everlasting kingdom. Amen. Ace, Sir, and Naomi have been received into the one holy Catholic and apostolic church through baptism. God has made them members of the household of God to share with us in the priesthood of Christ. So let us welcome them into this fellowship as we sing together hymn 482, Baptize and Walk. We're going to walk up and down the aisle. Before we go to God's word this morning, I, I neglected an important announcement about a brass and organ holiday concert. This was something that our minister of music, Michael Britt, had been working on. And when Michael died in August, um, the, the group of brass musicians called me and said, we'd really love to proceed with this concert in memory of Michael. And Marvin Mills, um, who many of you know, agreed to step in. So I hope that you will Put that on your calendar. It's Sunday, December the 11th at 7 p.m. And it should be a wonderful evening of um, celebrating Michael Britt as we move toward the holidays together. Let us pray. Savior God. Guide us into and through your word that we might be shaped by your spirit's message to us today and transformed for service in your world. Amen. Today's reading comes from the gospel according to Luke. Listen now for a word from God. And as I mentioned to the children, this is the, these are the words that Zechariah spoke after Nine months of forced silence. Zechariah, John's father, was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied, Blessed are you, the Most High God of Israel, for you have visited and redeemed your people. You have raised up a mighty Savior for us in the house of David, as you promised through the mouths of your holy ones, the prophets of ancient times. Salvation from our enemies and from the hands of all our foes. 
You have shown mercy to our ancestors by remembering the holy covenant you made with them, the oath you swore to Sarah and Abraham granting that we, delivered from the hands of our enemies, might serve you without fear in holiness and justice in your presence all our days. And you, my child, will be called the prophet of the Most High, for you'll go before our God to prepare the way for the Promised One, giving the people the knowledge of salvation through forgiveness of their sins. Such is the tender mercy of our God, who from on high will bring the rising sun to visit us, to give light to those who live in darkness and the shadow of death, and to guide our feet into the way of peace. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Please pray with me. O oh God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable to you, O oh Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. There once, there once were three friends who were eager workers, and one of them chose to devote himself to making peace between people who were fighting in accordance with blessed are the peacemakers. The second chose to visit the sick. The third went off to live in tranquility in the desert. The first toiled away among the quarrels of human beings, but could not resolve them all, and so he went to the one who was looking after the sick, and he found him flagging too, not succeeding in fulfilling the commandment. So the two of them agreed to go and visit the one who was living in the desert. They told him of their difficulties and asked him to tell them what he had been able to do. He was silent for a time. Then he poured water into a bowl and said to them, look at the water. It was all turbulent. A little later, he told them to look at it again and see how the water had settled down. When they looked at it, they saw their own faces as in a mirror. Then he said to them, in the same way, a person who is living in the midst of people does not see his own sins because of all the disturbance, but if he becomes tranquil, especially in the desert, then he can see his own shortcomings. I remembered this story from Benedicta Ward's book, The Wisdom of the Desert Fathers, as I thought about Zechariah's words today in Luke. Zechariah had nine months of his own silence forced upon him by the angel Gabriel after Zechariah expressed doubt in the angel's declaration that Zechariah's wife, Elizabeth, would give birth to a child, John the Baptist, who would prepare the way for the coming of the Lord. Like the first two characters in this desert father's story, Zechariah was also an eager worker, a busy priest, toiling day after day in the temple. He and Elizabeth were blameless before God, according to the text. In other words, they were models of faith role models of sorts who others look to in order to strengthen their own faith. And yet when God's messenger showed up with holy words, Zechariah wasn't able to hear them. Something was off. Now it's possible that clergy are especially prone to this problem since we spend more of our time than is good for us talking teaching a class, preaching a sermon, weighing in on this or that, such that we forget that our true task is and always has been to listen, to listen for God's voice speaking through the word in these pages, the word incarnate in people's lives, the word in creation, the spirit moving through and beyond us and others. 
I did a lot of listening this week in Cuba when we visited our sister church in Kemawani, partly because I am so very bad at speaking Spanish. And when you are immersed in a language that is not your first one, you have to spend a great deal of time and energy listening much more closely than you do when the language is your own. But like Zechariah, I think I needed to be put in a position to listen more than I spoke. Because I don't think I had realized how much my own narrative of what's going on in the world, in the church, even in my own life, had started to become a bit of an echo chamber. I had become a bit narrowed on our own internal issues. Questions like, is everyone going to come back to church? drives up my anxiety about our resources, our budget for 2023, our ability to keep staff and pay them fairly, keeping up with these buildings that are in constant need of maintenance, and missional work all amid the needs that continue to grow with each year that our city continues to lose population. Questions like, is our country headed for another civil war? drives up my anxiety about the growing violence and tends to drive me to work harder and longer before I've pondered whether working harder and longer leads to change or just cynicism about what is actually able to be changed. Meanwhile, I found that the Cubans have their own anxieties to deal with. Food shortages, political repression, the lack of medical supplies, inflation, and rolling power outages, which we experience several times during the week, have hollowed out their own attendance at church, with more than 150,000 Cubans expected to flee to the U.S. this year alone. Initially, my mind turned to the old, well, your pain must be worse than my pain, zero-sum suffering game that I have played many times in my past. Look on the bright side, Andrew. Things are much worse for the Cubans than they are for Brown Memorial. But I didn't go there this time, partly because things are really bad for some of you. I hate it that Tom is doing chemo for cancer while he and Taylor are expecting their first child. I hated receiving the phone call this morning from Ann Teef that her husband had died. I see the anxieties that have crippled some of you or members of your family. I know some of you are having trouble making ends meet with the inflation that we've seen. I'm worried too that our political divisions might be worse than we've seen, the climate situation, and on and on. I have no idea whether our church will bounce back from the pandemic and will regain our footing, or whether the changes that we've seen are here to stay. The suffering comparison game never works, because of course there is always someone, there is always someone who is worse off than you. What I heard instead in our exchange in Cuba when I really listened was actually the Word of God. Faith and hope that have been gifted both to us and to our Cuban siblings in the faith. The Word that Pastor Marielas preached on Sunday about patience that is needed when waiting for the kingdom to come. Not a passive waiting, but an active waiting vibrant one. The word of God that I heard in the Bible study on Tuesday as Cubans engaged each other and us in questions about how to be good friends in the midst of so much suffering. That faith, I know that faith sometimes sounds incredibly unrealistic. Hear it again, according to Zechariah, God promises to save us from the violence and the hunger and the divisions and the loss, meaning that we fear, and the loss of meaning that we fear to give light to those who live in darkness and the shadow of death and to guide our feet 
into the ways of peace. But God's way of granting that salvation is so incredibly humble that we are liable, I think, to devalue it before we've even given it a chance. Salvation is gifted to us in a Jew born into scandal, in the midst of a giant empire that doesn't care who he is. Giant promises are granted to us through a person who purposefully decides not to start a violent revolution, but instead teaches us how to live by breaking bread together, healing people who we don't always think deserve it, crossing boundaries to show that those boundaries are only real if you choose to observe them, drawing together a community of people who aren't valued for their degrees or their money, but only because they are interested in living together in a different kind of way. It's as if the word is saying to us, settle down your thoughts, settle down your worries and anxieties so that you can see that what you most need right now is here, is here and available to you. That unrealistic faith had my attention this week. I saw the burdens of difficult living shouldered by a community that gathers together around food and laughter and coffee and dancing and the tasks of daily living. I heard some young Cubans share their own dreams about coming to the United States and told them the truth about how hard it can actually be for new immigrants to our shores. We sat through blackouts and laughed at the Cubans' biting humor toward their own government as they exclaimed in the darkness, another gift from the revolution. <laughs> the thought occurred to me that the listening and the laughing and the struggling and the eating and the dancing and the hoping and the shared tears, whether here in this church or in that one, is the gift of faith. And not a gift that is like an add-on to everything else in our lives, but the thing that would teach us what all living is really about. Connection, care, shared suffering, growing together in a community that wants to practice love and strive for justice together. This stewardship season, you are asked as a member of this church to pledge a portion of your income to the church. I can make a compelling case that the church budget really needs participation from all of us this year as we do our best to regain our footing. I hope that you will actually get out your tax return, look at your actual income, and set a real goal for you in your own generosity. And yet I fear that starting with that kind of a financial transactional approach has it all backwards. Stewarding your life is about treating that gift as the gift that you are tending to that gift with intentionality to ask yourself the question, am I spending my life, including my money but not limited to it, am I spending my life in the way that would bring the most love and connection and joy and justice into my own life and the lives of others? And what changes would I need to make so that this could be true? Don't let the gift of your life become an afterthought after you have allowed everything else to determine who you are and what you can be. Let the generosity that God incarnated in your life guide everything that you choose to do. Because the kingdom of God has promised that God has promised really is at hand. Sometimes even the highest priests among us, the most devoted of monks, the best of our clergy need to be reminded that this is true. Joy and justice and peace 
and well-being continue to be offered to us in simple gifts of bread and rum and Bible study and salsa dancing and laughter at our political follies that these days know no borders. Such is the tender mercy of our God from whom on high brings the rising sun to visit us, gives light to those living in darkness and the shadow of death, and does guide our feet into the paths of peace. Please stand now and let us confess our faith together using the Apostles' Creed, which is the confession that has been used at baptisms dating back at least to the second century. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. In response to God's abundant gifts among us, let us give generously to Christ's mission and ministry. You can do that this morning by placing cash or a check in the offering plate, or by using the QR code in your bulletin. Let us present our tithes and our offerings to the Lord.
risen Savior, responding to your love and grace, we offer our gifts of time, talent, and service. May our offerings feed the hungry, clothe the poor, quench the thirsty, and shelter the most vulnerable among us. In your name we pray. Amen. Please be seated. Let's join our hearts together now in prayer. Let us pray. Great God of abundant blessing, as we approach a holiday of gratitude and a new liturgical year, we pause to give you thanks and praise. We do acknowledge all good gifts that come from you and for the many ways that you bless us. Especially, we thank you for family and loved ones who encircle us with care, for clear skies and starry nights that stun us with your creation's beauty for acts of kindness and compassion shared between neighbors and strangers, for leaders who defy partisan rhetoric and rancor to act with honesty and integrity. And yet the sun sinks early and the days grow short in this darkening season, holy God. Your people languish, yearning for a break from bad news and heavy burdens. In our despair, we turn to you and lift our hope-filled petitions for the needs of your people. We pray for victims of violence, war, and oppressive regimes. We pray for those in need of healing from trauma today. We pray for those whose spirits are burdened by mental illness. We pray for those who believe they are beyond help and hope. We pray for healing for Tom and for support for Tom and Taylor. We pray that your love might surround the McPherson family this day and that we might do our part to make it so. We humble ourselves before you, Christ our King, to pray for our redemption and for the world. May we live and love and forgive as you did. May we resist evil forces that seek to turn us away from a humane path. May we embrace your way of peace, transformed into lives of love and grace. Now hear us, the prayer that Christ taught us and the spirit that he taught us, saying together, our mother who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
that we say in all that we do is that your baptism is sufficient for your calling. Doesn't matter what that calling is, who you are, or where you're called to serve, your baptism is sufficient for your calling. So I invite you to make space this week in the silence and remember that this is true. Everywhere you go, every struggle that you face. And as you go, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you and among you and between you this day and every day of your gifted life.